Damien, can you tell me a little bit about your outfit? Uh, it is. Um, so this was for my CD before she actually uh, left service post. So she went to a different post and she gave mm -hmm. these out to, I guess, I'm not going to say she gave it to her favorite PCVs, but I'm going to say she gave it to her favorite PCVs. Yeah, so that doesn't lineage. look like something you give out to everybody. No, so yeah, this is lineage. I said this is this is like she gave to her first her favorite PCVs, which I am really grateful to have because this is so beautiful. Um, so it's a um, yeah, it's a flag. It's a Yana flag to put Yana colors. Uh, Peace Corps logo here, and the Peace Corps what it is. So that's that. This is from Ashley from Guyana as well. Uh, mm. So this is an actual Guyana like. Um, Zina, how would you call this? this is a, um... It's a dashiki. It's more in the Afro, it's um, a dashiki, which is prominent in African culture and so afro Guyanese men. But because we're so multicultural, you will find um, other ethnicity wearing them. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's so that's beautiful. The beads are from Guyana as well. So all these pretty much. And around his, yeah, the beads from his neck too. My earrings as well are from Guyana. This is more of the outrage outskirts. Out. Yeah, so you gotta represent the true culture of all. So Guyana is like again, I think Guyana is so diverse. You have to it's put it all. Judy, hey Judy, hi. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Damien. I apologize. You won't stop doing it. <laughs> hey, Judy. Yeah, so everything I feel like Guyana is so diverse. I'm trying to like literally put every piece of everything together. It's like everything you will see on my body pretty much is some form of Guyana. Wow. I should have followed your lead. I should have coordinated with you guys. The only thing I yeah. have is my Madagascar ring. I also um, know. They do silversmanship, and right. that's the only thing I have. I see Renata, who, um, yeah, we served in Madagascar together. I don't know if you can unmute yourself, but you can't. Okay. Good to see you. Fazila, is your um, t-shirt also from Guyana or your dress? No, I um, I got the dress over here, but I try to coordinate my outfit with Damien's dashiki. So, mm -hmm. and also we are, because as Damien mentioned, the, uh, we're very multicolored. So you'd always find that Guyanese are wearing print outfits. And so I, I love print outfits. Okay, beautiful. Oh, Ren served in Madagascar. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we're just going to wait a little bit. We are live streaming now through a couple of pages on Facebook. Um, we have a few people still joining us, so just going to give it a minute or so. Uh, For anyone in the audience, feel, please feel free to use the chat for questions or anything else you have in mind. Uh, and I think uh, we're good. We should get started soon in just a period of time. So. I, um, I just see Judy White is here. She is a RPCV as well, and she served in Guyana. And she loved Guyana so much that she extended her stay for a little bit longer. And we were just talking the other day about the phenomenal work she did with um, a girl. I'm sure she will share, but it was so amazing to have her in the country as well. So uh, I'm gonna get started and thank you so much everybody for being here today. Uh, first off, uh, welcome to our Careers in Peace Building Talk Store series. Uh, my name is Jose Virgil from the Montana Institute for Peace. Uh, at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Our talk story today will focus on the training volunteers and community members in Peace Corps, Guyana, uh, with Basila Mohammed, Damien Owens, and Stephanie Singh. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about the journey into the profession. Uh, today we'll be live streamed on our community Facebook pages through the 100 Kids Italian Veterans Education Center, aka Club 100, Comfort Alliance, Keith Louis Honolulu, 
We turn peace toward the volunteers of Hawaii, University of Hawaii, Manila, Office of Civic and Community Engagement, and the Mount Vernon Youth Movement. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Peace Corps and the University of Hawaii at Manila Office of Civic and Community Engagement. Um, since 2018, the Mount Sinai Institute has partnered with the Peace Corps to bring the Peace Corps Prep Program, which is an undergraduate certificate to the University of Hawaii at Manila uh, here at UH. Uh, the University of Manila still supports the Peace Corps mission that Peace and cooperation among nations can best be achieved through global engagement. Peace Corps Prep typically combines both academic coursework and the experience with the cultural skills and leadership development to enable you to be a strong applicant for the Peace Corps service area that fits your interests and skills, as well as enables you to potentially earn a UH Manila Peace Study Certificate separately. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Peace Corps Prep Certificate, um, I'll put the link in the chat. And otherwise, you can also, in the final recording, it'll be provided in summary. Or you can go to Peace under academic programs. Today's event will be a talk story with Basile Mohammed, a past Peace Corps language and cultural facilitator, housing specialist, and small grants manager. Uh, we will learn about her unique perspective and stories of training, preparing, and facilitating partnerships between host country, communities, and Peace Corps volunteers in Guyana education, health, and environment sectors. Also joining us will be Damien Owens, who served as a Peace Corps health education facilitator in Guyana from 2015 to 2017. Uh, Stephanie Singh, uh, a Peace Corps recruiter currently here at the University of Hawaii at Manila and also served in Madagascar from 2016 through 2018, will moderate today's event. Uh, Basila Mohammed was a, a, little, a language and culture facilitator for Peace Corps Guyana in 2015. She was hired on as a housing coordinator in 2016 and added the role of small grants coordinator in 2018 to her portfolio. She enjoyed being a part of the Peace Corps Guyana work and supporting the volunteers as they built the goals of the Peace Corps. Damien Owens is a high school teacher currently and a real estate agent in the Hawaii community. He served as a Peace Corps health education facilitator in Guyana, which is in South America uh, from 2015 to 2017. He truly enjoys effective employing, effectively employing and developing strategies to help students grow their skill sets, which will further their goals of joining building trades in various college programs. Stephanie Singh is the current Peace Corps recruiter here at UH Manoa, who serves as an education volunteer and the southeastern coast of Madagascar. Um, she's passionate about exploring all of the beauty and issues that come with peace building. And to get us started today, I'm going to turn it over to our good old friend, Stephanie. Thanks. Thank you, Jose. Um, and thank you for that introduction. I also just want to thank the Matsunaga Institute um, and you for all of your work with engaging the community and all of the various peace building events and series. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you give me a thumbs up if the volume is great? Awesome. So my name is Stephanie Sang and I served in the Peace Corps from 2016 to 2018 um, in the coast, southeastern coast of Madagascar. Um, I am the Peace Corps recruiter at UH Manoa. So before we start, I would like to give those of you unfamiliar with Peace Corps a bit of background. Um, the Peace Corps is a service opportunity for motivated change makers to really immerse themselves in a community overseas, um, working side by side with local leaders to tackle some of the most pressing issues of our time. And our mission is threefold for our PCVs, you probably, and staff, you probably know this by heart, but first is to help people of interested countries meet their need for trained men and women, um, to help a better understanding of Americans on the part of the people you serve. And then goal three is to promote a better understanding of other people um, on the part of Americans. So when you come back um, from service, so throughout the talk, if you feel interested in learning more about the Peace Corps and how to apply um, or serve or how to serve again, if you feel so called to do so, um, I'll put my email in the chat for anyone who wants to follow up. Um, but I am so excited to get to talk story or gas, right, as you say, um, with Fazila and Damien and hope that my questions can be a spark to whatever direction you like to take us today with your stories. Um, so maybe something very starting off very simply, um, as you think of the Peace Corps, maybe the first time you ever heard of the organization, what interested you about it? Um, and can you give us some background information that would help us understand why 
you would be drawn to the organization. So I sort of remember um, hearing about the Peace Corps in high school um, and then really getting interested in college, um, especially the language learning aspect of it and the immersion for two, two, up to two years, um, or at least two years. Um, I just thought that this would be an organization where I could maybe find some like-minded uh, service people. But I'm really interested in hearing how you first came across it and what drew you to the Peace Corps. I think you're muted, Azila, <laughs> sorry. Apologies. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here today to talk story about the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is so close to my heart and I just love the adventure and the warning that took place while I was a part of it and hopefully I will be a part of it again. I remember as when I was in high school we had volunteers in the high school teaching. So I was a recipient of Peace Corps volunteer when I was a teenager. And one of the things that really was fascinating for me was they were always sharing their stories about their lives, their travel. And when you come from Guyana, you're like always excited about like just traveling the world and exploring cultures and exploring food. And so I've always, at the back of my mind, as I continued schooling and continued other jobs, I always still had this, uh, this need for adventure. And so when the Peace Corps advertised for a, um, an LCF, I totally applied for the job because I was like, oh my gosh, this is my opportunity to share Guyanese culture with Americans. And it's my opportunity to learn about Americans and, and their lives. And I was, that's what drew me to the Peace Corps. And it still is the fascinating thing that keeps me here. Great job, Zila. Uh, for me, man, it's really started off where you would say like, um, Hawaii says uh, talk story, like you said, Stephanie, and for Guyanese is gaffing, right? So literally, I always found myself doing volunteering work uh, on a mass, like a mass scale. So it'd be either from greenhouses, helping design or build greenhouses for people, urban gardens, um, I'm kind of like dating myself. So like um, camp, uh, camp things, anything to sort. But really what happens was I was literally always around uh, volunteers from all sorts, and we never really put a name to ourselves. We just kind of hang out. That's what you do, right? You, you hang out with like folks. And one day we was just at the bar talking, and there was somebody was talking about different like Madagascar. Somebody was talking about how they went to um, uh, South America and did all these great things. I'm like, man, you did all this for free? They're like, yeah, we got a stipend. I was like, I'm on it. So what is this thing called? It was like Peace Corps. So I went to a recruiting um, again at a, at a social event, uh, and uh, they was like, oh man, you know, I went to. Um, uh, what was the one place? Argentina. And so my mind was like, okay, let me do this thing. So I actually looked online. I was like, fell in love with it. Like it speaks to my core, right? So I'm already doing these things. I might as well go take it to the next level. And I was able to do that. And so it was really a profound thing. And I, I was telling individuals, once you, once you get a taste of Peace Corps, man, you're always going to be Peace Corps. So it's like, I'm lucky I had the opportunity, man, to do that. And I, I do look forward to probably doing it again in the future, the future, future. future. Yeah. Thank you both for that. Um, and after you went through the process of learning about it and deciding to apply, do you still remember sort of um, getting off the plane or would you two be able to set the scene because we're talking about Peace Corps Guyana and what it felt like um, stepping out of the plane, maybe the weather or some sights, sounds, smells and tastes that you might remember? Yeah, so for me, so if you come from, um... If you come from West Coast coming over, you come in a day early and you're staging in Miami. I've never been to Miami, I've been to Florida once, but uh, it's kind of crazy, right? So you're doing like, you do a lot of traveling. So when I got, so we finally got to Miami, we did a day staging, tell them what we we're going to do. Uh, so we actually had to go from Miami to Guyana. Uh, it's a long waiting period. So you got to go through, um, I think they had the Caribbean Airlines at the point. At the point. So we get there and then we came in at night. So we started traveling afternoon, but we didn't get there until the nighttime. So we finally got to Peace Corps. It was pitch dark and like literally I'm, my mind's blown anyway because I'm a Midwest guy by heart right so I'm in Midwest never been out of, outside of the state so let alone to a sub, you know to a South America and uh, so I'm blown by that stoke tires or whatever but I'm super excited so when you get to Guyana 
you're in the dark. And it really is one of those, like, you got to think about it, you are in the Amazon, right? So it's literally, the smell is over, it's aroma, it's like, you can't even, it's like your fire cologne, you find a perfume, it's just that good, it smells that good, like, literally, it's like tasty, it's like mouth watering good. So for me, it was like, oh my God, so instantly my, my, my taste buds went to overdrive, my nostrils went crazy, I was like, what is this, you know what I mean? So uh, so that in itself, and it's dark. So you know, now you're seeing stars, right? No lighting, you know, sorry. So you can really see the galaxies if you want to look that far. Uh, so that was the experience where itself got the plane. So we all like super wary, scary, shaking. It's like uh, if you ever went to high school, right? And you was a freshman. When you you're a freshman, you come in and think you know what you know in Miami, right? But when you get to senior year, you're back at freshman again. So it was just like that. Like we still get down there. When you're down there, it's like oh my god, I'm so nervous. So you said taste, right? So that was a taste. What was the other one? I didn't catch that one. The taste was that one. And you say, oh, the setting. So the setting again at night. And um, maybe the weather. The weather, right? So at that point, I, so when I left St. Louis, it's frigid. Like right now, you guys got a lot going. Texas is crazy right now. So I had a Texas weather going on. About uh, just getting out of that. And then uh, so when I left, came over there, it was like super like hot at night so you sweating at night like what what is this so it's like super hot right so the weather again but then it's tropic so um the weather was, it was a nice breeze cool but it was hot so it was at night hot but then it really it cools down quick when you get a cross breeze so that was like good so Anna has two seasons mostly wet and hot and we kind of came with within that wet hot stage so you sweat out your first year of clothes and uh, so don't try to look too pretty because you're going to sweat out that. And then you start smelling yourself. So all the tasty smells go away when you start smelling your own BO. So, yeah, that's where that's where I met with that. So and then other than that, and um, yeah, I don't want to keep going with this thing. because It's just like now you start making me reminisce more than we'd be here for three hours. No, thank you for placing us in Guyana with you from all of the site smells um, and the weather. Um, so for this session, the session is called Bridging the Divide, and it's part of, um, as Jose was saying, the Careers in Peace Building talk story series. So would you be able to describe sort of the roles you played in Peace Corps and how those jobs contributed to um, peace building? I, um, when, I, when I think about the roles I played in Peace Corps, I go through like this wonderful um, phases. I started out as the language and um, cross-cultural facilitator. And essentially what that was, was a um, training sessions of Guyanese culture, custom, history, ways of talking, ways of dressing to a incoming group of volunteer, or as we would say, trainee. So, when the cohort got here, I was one of two language and cultural facilitator and we had sessions and we talked stories, but in Guyana we say gaffing because um, in Hawaii their local language is pidgin, in Guyana our local language is Creolese, and so when you someone start talking Creolese, even though it's a broken form of English, you might be like, what, what is this person saying? And then um, Afterwards, I was hired as the housing coordinator. And what this was, was responsible for where all of the volunteers in the country lived. And so, for example, if we were going to have 40 volunteers coming into the country, I would travel around all the countries, all the little villages, recruiting families to host volunteers and train families to host volunteers. So if if we we're catering for 40 people, we would I would go to like sometimes 100 communities and meet about three, four families in each community. Because when a family come on board, you want them to understand this whole cross culturedness that's happening. And so that the volunteer can express themselves, be themselves. And at the same time, the family can learn and be comfortable in their own, own home setting. And then, so that took a time and, Along the way, I really enjoyed um, helping volunteers with projects that they have. And so I added the um, portfolio of small grants coordinator to my job. In, and this is when a volunteer comes to the country, after they're in their community for a while, together with their community, they could decide to do a small project. And, and, the, pros, and the process for that project will be like 
they have to put together a concept paper, how they're going to spend, spend the budget, how the community is going to get involved, what is the intention of the project. And so I helped facilitate that from the beginning to the end. And so I think from my perspective as a past staff, that's how we work towards getting the volunteer into the community and be a part of the community from that um, side. So you ensure that the families see the perspective that the volunteer is coming from and the volunteers see the perspective of the family and the community through conversations, through training, through dialogue, through um, tr um, communication sessions, sometimes simple things as taking a volunteer to a wedding, to a funeral, to a birthday party. Those are all part of helping bridging the culture because the more opportunity a volunteer gets to observe what's going on in their community and in the country, the more they're able to relate to what is happening. And so the more they're able to be a part of that community. And the more you're able to be a part of the community, the more settled you get, so the more comfortable you get with the job that you are to do. So that's from my perspective. But Damien, what do you think? Thank you for throwing the ball. Anyway, so for me, man, uh, I really was stuck thinking because my mentality when I came was uh, just construction, right? So anything with safety, OSHA related this type of stuff, I'm thinking like health will be just that, right? But no, it's really, you put on a lot of caps. I mean, you can put on a different cap every day. Uh, so my, my, I really came in there again with a construction mindset, but safety was my uh, forte, but I'm a yoga instructor as well, right? So I figured that anything that had to do with health, I was going to bring that to the game. So uh, I was, it took me, and then again, I didn't know the geographical of Guyana as much as I thought I did, because when you watch it on TV, you watch it on Discovery Channel, you watch it on uh, National Geographic, you think you know the, the terrain until you get there. So when you, you don't really know what you'll be doing, but you got a concept of what you'll bring to the table. And uh, so my cap was like really a lot of caps. So anywhere from help, housing, uh, helping the housing, uh, voluntary transitioning in, uh, making upgrades on um, uh, places like voluntary places they need help, advising, uh, structural aspects of a, of a property that if you want to put a host of uh, volunteer in, maybe something like that. Uh, so I also was connected to a medic. So that was an eye opener for me because I'm thinking again, I have no, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, I look good on TV as one. Well, but I don't have that ability to do that, right? So then when I got an opportunity to do that, uh, I was doing a lot of um, uh, like home visits. Uh, so I do a lot of home visits, checking on wellness, uh, doing a lot of wellness checks, like kind of right now with COVID and everything else, kind of doing the same thing, doing wellness check with individuals, doing um, managing of all sorts. And then if you kind of look at it, um, one of my biggest, uh, one of my things I'm really proud of is when I was up, I was, so I, I was stayed on these. So I was with the Native Americans, or you say Native people, Indigenous people, I'm sorry. And so that in itself was a population of 500. I was literally up there by myself. So it takes an hour to get to my site, uh, 22 hours by boat. And then if you want to go through the Amazon, it's like 14 hours. So it wasn't that I could like, go around the corner. And back. So at that time, um, I didn't really know what I was going to do because I'm thinking like they don't need construction, but I understand they needed some concept of construction, right? So I introduced yoga. So I use the ladies. And the only thing I, I try to always do is keep an open mind. So I would tell any volunteer, keep an open mind when you do take on these mini caps, just kind of see and gaff or talk story of these individuals, they'll tell you what you really need. And you just go back into what you already naturally does. So I, I'm a yoga instructor. A lot of women were saying that, hey, you know, I, a lot of guys do. So it was like a taboo, right, for a male to do yoga. So I'm teaching these guys concepts they already know. And so I had to change the yoga concept and say stretching, right? And then, so that was one, working with the medic, I learned a BMI chart. That helped me also understand how to get these guys in a healthy uh, background, uh, how, to, how to use that, to, uh, tell them, hey, you know, in a, I'm, I said already in the clinic, let's go out here and do something positive. Another thing is another community development was, was they work with a Tushal. So that's really awesome because they have a, a panel of sevens. Tushal get two times to come up as a, in four, I think it's a three year, four year term or something like that. Please learn more about that. Anyway, oh, so yeah, I was able to literally work with them closely, but also get the community on a, on a, up together. So I was facilitating a lot of things. I didn't even know titles to it. It was just more likely. I just knew that I love people and I love the way that it was great we gave and gave each other uh, accommodations to do what we want to do so um, so yoga was one I had a yoga session on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays kind of broke it up and helping with that uh, another day we did was one of the big I mean the biggest biggest thing was sustainability right so everybody talk about sustainability you had to use what you have you couldn't go out and buy something that you know go to uh, here is Granger or you might want to go to any one of the um, hardware stores you got to use what you have so one of the things I kind of designed was um, a sustainable uh, volleyball court 
and this was like a real, it was like a, it was 60 by 60 by 30 by eight foot tall um, court. We didn't have sand, we had a lot of dirt and mud. So I was able to literally use bamboo sticks, twine and fishing wire that was laid over somewhere and we can literally, and I taught these guys the three, four, five method, which is a construction concept we use commonly in all uh, phases of you building a house. So I was able to literally go back into all these tools that you have, right? And not, I had to get out of that, you just a construction worker, or you just gonna come here and literally let the, let the community tell me what they needed. So working through Shao, I actually got this, we all became, uh, we, we actually eliminated a lot of toxic, toxicity in the community itself, right? So that may be from drinking, or anything was sort, and then we also we was able as a team. I was able to give the project over, so it's like I was able to teach and give over what I knew, and they gave me more like how to cook in a bush without a stove and like lighting. So it's like it was a win-win situation for me. I got a lot more, but it just again mini caps. Just go put on mini caps. Yeah, yes. I can relate to that, um, and I I know like. <laughs> Part of being able to put on so many caps too is aided by our LCF. And I remember going into Peace Corps not knowing just how much labor that our language and cross-cultural facilitators, staff, everybody, and the organization is sort of laying it all out for us from anything as simple as language learning um, and spending. I think sometimes volunteers like to say like, oh, we spent all day in the morning to like evening language learning. But then on the other hand, it's like, there's people going back and preparing the lesson plan for the next day. <laughs> and you sort of just get to relax. Um, and so Fazila, I wonder if you would mind telling us about the process for not only training volunteers, but I mean, your many hats too with host families. Um, I'm sure there's misunderstandings and conflicts that arose um, and from the different cultural backgrounds. So I wonder if you have any techniques or maybe even some funny stories or Damien, if you've experienced those like cultural misunderstandings or how you were able to resolve them. Um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind sharing about that. Oh yes, definitely. Um, so one of the things as I mentioned earlier, if we're preparing for 40 volunteers to come, I would see at least 120 families or sometimes more. Why? Because in my own self, I had worked out this formula because when I was a part of the Peace Corps Guyana, I created this whole training module for how to train host families. And I used it based on the experiences. I used it based on some feedback I got from other training, other Peace Corps, um, from community members, expectation of Peace Corps volunteers. And so as you listen to it and you start a process of analysis, you realize, oh, this needed to be bridged and this needed to be bridged and that needed to be bridged in order for it to work with a volunteer and a host country national. So in my process of seeing 140 people or sometimes more, I kept like a few simple things um, at the top of my mind when I was speaking to a family. Um, things like a, a host family must be able to understand that this is a cross-cultural exchange. And so while I'm communicating with a family member and I ask questions like maybe on religion or maybe on um, ethnicity or just how you spend your day. And I'm like, huh, I'm wondering, will this person keep an open mind? And so that was my second thing when I was talking to host, recruiting host families. I'm like, you have, I always kept like my, my brain was always, is this person going to be able to have an open mind at all times to understand that this really is a cross-cultural exchange process? And finally, another thing I thought about is, you must be able to communicate and you must be able to communicate in such a way that you have to understand that communication is going to get sensitive, it's going to get negative, it's going to get positive, but are you able to do it? And so if you really understand the dynamics of Guyana and you research it, we're so popular right now because um, Guyana is always a developing country and always in the news for one thing or the other, you'd see that our 
you, we, we are very multicultured, we are very multi-ethnic, we are, um, our education levels varied, our um, history and our um, religious practices and our various language styles, it's all a part of this um, melting pot that makes up us as Guyanese. And so whenever I spoke to a host family, I always had to remember those things. Like when all of these factor into play, how will this person be able to relate to a volunteer and how will the volunteer be able to relate to the family? And because I always walked away thinking a family is gonna have to be comfortable in their own home hosting an American. The American has to be comfortable in this place because they're strange until they get accustomed and they get settled and integrated. And then I thought that, you know, a family has to be able to walk around the community, introduce the volunteer, take them to various events, teach them how to get on the bus, get on public transportation, how to make an appointment, how to like the right way to greet elders, the right way to dispose of your garbage and those sort of things. Because I find that the smallest things can sometimes offend. And so it was always to bridge that gap. It was always, can this family keep an open mind? Can this family be able to understand this is a cultural exchange? Can this family understand that communication is a really important part of this process? And so as I talked and I met with family, sometimes I would meet with a family more than once, sometimes three, four times before I'm like, ah, oh, this is gonna work. And when I've done through that process of elimination and families are selected, um, we, would have a training session, like a one day training session, and we do it regionally. Why? Again, it's divided into 10 administrative regions. It's like municipalities, I think, in America context. And so, and each region has its own um, dynamic, like ethnicity, religious practices, um, pop, um, popularity, traditions. And so we would I would craft the training session to target the specificities of a region to try to show that, okay, this is a volunteer, this is what they're coming here to do, this is how they're gonna wanna do it. And then this is the family, these are the expectations, these are how you do it. And the most importantly, you train the family. You have to talk, you have to ask questions, you have to have the ability to just be who you are, but at the same time, understand that this is a process. And so it took a lot of back and forth, but families were so super excited to open their homes to volunteers because they saw the positive contribution that volunteers do in the community. And so they were always willing to say, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this. And that's how we were able to get um, families and volunteers together so they can have a successful service. I just missed it so much. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was, I remember when we were talking before, you're talking about a specific example um, I think you said something about dogs or something. <laughs> I wonder if you could share that story. So um, I went into this community one. Oh, I must say that I am super afraid of dogs. I have a phobia where dogs are concerned. And I was bitten when I was a child. And now, even in the midst of traffic, if I see a dog on the road, I'd cross the road to avoid the dog. And it's so scary. So I went to this community and this host this prospective host family they were so awesome they actually hosted for me I think like three times in total they had a dog and they said oh the dog is out they took it away but I don't know how the dog got out and the dog rushed into the kitchen and I swear I have a sixth sense where this is concerned I jumped on the table and I was like save me save me save me from the dog please and it was such a soothing, simple dog. It didn't have anything to do with me. It didn't care that I was wrong. And so since then, the host families are always telling the story about me and the dog. It was, it's so funny. I still, I still blush when I think about it. Yeah, the one of the reasons I brought that up is because um, I remember in 
Madagascar or volunteers are very attached to animals. I think maybe that's an uh, American thing, but attached especially to dogs. Um, where in some countries that you go to, dogs are seen as animals, you know, and um, they're there to help guard the house. And maybe they have a different cultural meaning attached to the animal. But yeah, just to like illustrate that peace building sometimes is so unexpected. You have to explain the meaning of an animal to this culture in order to like bridge that uh, miscommunication because I think easily somebody could, for example, be tossing a rock at a dog or like doing something normal um, in that context um, towards something like a dog and that be misinterpreted uh, completely. That, that is so true, um, Stephanie, because in Guyana, we do treat dog in that from that perspective that you've just shared as well. We treat animals like that. And I find it fascinating myself when I walk around the communities and I see a dog being strolled in a stroller. It's for me, it's like, wow, this is an interesting thing because we, we think of um, animals differently. And so one of the things I know it's part of the training session um, with the volunteer and as well that has been incorporated in host family training is to have that communications about animals and about pets and to talk about what does a pet mean for me and what does a pet mean for you? And if you, and if as a host family, you're gonna allow me to have a pet in your home and the rules that are necessary for you to take care of that pet. And, but at the same time, how do I expect you to treat the pet in my home? And so you are right, that is a fascinating conversation that we always train for at Peace Corps Guyana, because it does mean different things for different people. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it can, peace building, I, as I think people who've done the Peace Corps um, can attest to, comes from some of the most mundane uh, items of daily living and life and communication but also some of going more to the more serious side i know this past summer um during the black lives matter movement the national peace corps association held a series of virtual town halls hoping to gather what peace corps might do differently and one being the renewed commitment for recruiting for diversity um, to accurately re reflect american diversity so I'm wondering if um, Damien or Fazila, you could speak to what does Peace Corps Guyana look like in terms of diversity and was that part of training at all? And um, maybe what was it like to teach American diversity to the Guyanese and also Guyanese diversity? I know you mentioned like Afro-Guyanese and the indigenous Guyanese and um, different populations uh, was that also taught to the trainees when they came? Uh, so when it like Black Lives Matter, uh, I was I came when right around when that time with Ferguson uh, was going through the transitioning, which much needed. I mean, I think everything is diversity, right? You think of America, you think about diversity. Uh, you think everyone has a has an opportunity to do what everyone should be doing. But when I got, when I went to actually Guyana was like such. Guyana is diversity. Guyana is a sovereign country that, I mean, state, I mean, uh, you would say nation or you would say just a uh, continent or a country of um, diversity. It actually speaks to the core of my, my beginning. My be, I'm a being. I'm getting kind of caught up with this because they have, uh, I say seven, but usually it's six. So they have the Guyanese. So it's the Indo Guyanese, Afro Guyanese. They have the, um, uh, we call it the uh, indigenous people. Chinese, black, and what is it? I think it's Portuguese. Portuguese. Portuguese, Portuguese, and then it's mixed in there. I would say they're in the mixed race. So that's, if you see a child, so I worked around the medic a lot and we see a lot of kids and you see these children with all this diversity in them. It's like, that's what you call an actual, you know, that's what, that to me was like natural. That was like a real uh, definition of diversity in itself, right? So. Uh, they don't, when you, when you make a movement or you make a sound, everyone has a voice, right? So when I teach students, I tell them, you know, this class, you have a voice. So everything's good around you. It's not, I'm a dictator, but I'm also looking at saying that you are, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, I have somebody got to be a mediator at somewhere at a point. But then when you look at the, if you look at the infrastructure of Guyana itself, 
literally got when I got there, they actually got their independence. They got their fifty of independence, and that was like a blessing to be a part of that. You know, they got they broke away from the British, and they had they just celebrated fifty of independence, and that was like to me that spoke so much diversity. Which uh, from St. Louis, I think again, you got so much culture in there, but yet again, it wasn't that diverse and like publicly uh, okay. And to say, and as such, in a way, to saying like it's okay to do that. So for me, uh, yeah, I mean, Ghana, man, is a true definition of diversity. Like if you look at, like, even though they are like, you know, you got the Indo, Afro, and you got the Indigenous people. If you look at how their uh, government is structured, everyone has a sector. You know, they parties, they parliament. So it's a parliament, right? So if you look at the political side of it, they all come together in some form or fashion. Different, different um, cultural people, but they don't really identify like that. So they don't really say, oh, I'm just I'm Guyanese, I'm Indo. No, we all just won. And that was like amazing to like sit next to a person and you don't see color. It's like you didn't even see, they didn't even see your color, they see your character more than your color. It's like Martha Luther King would say, right? It's more of your character. And I was like, I got a great character. I'm glad he, you know, and they, and they, they actually home on it. So that was a big thing for me is that, man. I just, um, yeah. And then the food, somebody asked about the food, right? So with a guy in ease, you got to like literally to get what get a, I mean, okay, this is how you get a guy in ease, right? And I was with the Emory, uh, Emory Indian community where again, it's all indigenous people. And they don't they don't speak much. So, uh, so one day I, I love to cook. So I love to cook. I changed my diet when I went over there. So I changed everything. I, you know, I had to cut my hair, and I was like, all right, I had to do the razor thing. So I was like, all right, I'm going in there, really going there, open minded. Like, okay, I'm off to really do the uh, Jack Hanna thing in the bush. You ain't gonna see me for like until I come out with a roster so far. I had everything anyway. I love to cook, and I'm really like I have I had open diet, right? It was most like a pescetarian diet, but most like they so. Two things, right? So once you got a host family, you got to be with host family is the host, host training is like literally before you actually go to your site, they put you with a host family and you stay with that host family for like, I think for us it's three months, thank you Jesus. But they now it's a little longer than that. But again, it was the opportunity to get kind of comfortable acclimated with the um, culture and who you'll be around everything like that. So uh, my host mom, I actually, uh, so no, Guyana's kind of in your, in your training, uh, bridging the gap, right? So in your training, they say, hey, it was around Mother's Day coming around that time. They said, you might want to bring something for your Mother's Day, right? So I'm like, so what, what, do, they, what do they need, right? Because they, they build everything, they make everything. So I went to, uh, I got this, uh, you guys know that pillar, like you peel potatoes with? It wasn't a potato, it was, like, it was like a vegetable pillar. I bought one for myself, bought one for my host mom, right? And I was super stoked, because I'm like, oh my God, I got it. And then when Mother's Day came, I gave it to her. And like, she's like, you know, she said, oh, thank you. And I'm like, I'm really stuck. Like, when are you going to use it? So I'm going downstairs every day. Like, did they use it? Because they use it. They was a farmer. There was a lot of farm. They had a lot of uh, vegetables. And I eat a lot of vegetables. I was like, cool. Now I can eat more vegetables, right? She never used it. So I'm thinking like, damn, I can't explain it. I think I explained it to her, but I didn't explain it, right? So anyway, so one time I was able to, um, they cook, uh, I'm kind of jumping around, but they cook a thing called, uh, they call it balanje. And I never really knew what Belanger was. I mean, and then you, so the concept of Belanger is to us in America is called uh, eggplant. It's purple, right? The little purple thing, whatever. And so my, one day I'm sitting at the table. I wasn't eating meat. They, they, they go, they go, they go catch a, they go catch a hog and and back down, and they slaughter this thing. I come out there. I mean, literally, it's gone, right? So I'm like, they think I'm. I say, hey, I don't eat. I don't eat. Um, I don't eat meat. I don't eat pork. I don't eat beef and anything like that. I'm really sea urchins or anything of the sort. And he's like, I thought they understood vegetarian, and then you, you'll face it with vegetarian, right? So my sister was looking at, my host was looking at me, and she, I was like, you eating it. We at the table, I'm eating this thing called pepper sauce. It's super good, and it's super hot. But I'm eating this, like, you know, I'm eating uh, roti, and I'm eating this thing, and I'm eating balanje. I'm like, I didn't know it was balanje, because I would never eat eggplant in America. I just wouldn't eat it. And I just like, this is one of my things. I just didn't know what to do with it. And so I'm smelling this thing, so I got stimulated. I'm like, what is this? She's like. She finally looked at me and said, man, you, you don't eat no meat. I said, well, I eat certain meats, but not all meat. She said, she said you, and I had a roster, I had a beer like out here, bald headed, everything else. And she was like, are you Muslim? I said, Muslim in a sense of what? She's like, as a religion? She's like, yeah. She said, I said, oh, why you say that? She's like, because you, you don't eat meat, you work out, you're healthy, you do all these things, you know, you, you don't drink, you don't do, I mean, you know, you, you, just, you just don't, you carry yourself a different way. I said, no, nah, I said, it doesn't. and I'm thinking like, wow, all this time you've been staring at me, and then she said, and then it was like a, a great old eye opener. I said, the only way I can really let them know who I am and what I can do is get in this kitchen. So one day I woke up super early, and I got in the kitchen. I started making roti. I started rolling up roti. Started making it like my mother did. I watched her. I'm a. I, in order to get a guy needs, you gotta watch what they do and then and implement it for yourself. So I rolled up, make roti like she was doing, and I started cooking my balanje. 
And like that literally opened up the door so us to make that dialogue. So that's like, you gotta like literally to get, yeah, I don't know if I jumped around this question, lost the question, but again, if you really get to what the guy needs, you really, to get them is really get in their kitchen. If you get in their kitchen, you got a guy in needs, you're good. I don't care how else you guys wanna look at it. For me, it was getting in the kitchen. And then since then, I got every guy in his kitchen. I learned how to do a pepper pot, all these things like that. And that really opened up the door to say that I was like, I made it. I got the guy in his, like, you only get these, you know, if you did amazing things. But no, I think that's how, that's how I got in there. I got in there by that, just being able to uh, get in the kitchen with a guy in his and then cook for a guy in his. And uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was a good moment. Yeah. I, I just want to jump in here and say, um, yes we love to feed you and so as long as you as long as you come over and you're visiting with us there is always something for you to eat and because as damien mentioned we are very um interconnected in our races and our ethnicity and our historical foods and culture and food is like a super big thing in any culture so when a guy when a when a person come over, you give them like curries or rotis, rice, um, eggplant, or we say balanje or baigan, bora and everything. And you just get them in your kitchen. And the, if, you know, some a person come over and a guy and he say, come help me cook, you know that you've built trust, you've built friendship, you've gained ground rule when they say, come and help me in the kitchen. So Damon is right. But to go back to your initial question, Stephanie, about um, diversity in um, the Peace from the Peace Corps staff perspective, Peace Corps um, GAN has progressively worked with Peace Corps headquarters to diversify the cohort that comes into the country because you, you want to um, let the Guyanese population and the children that Peace Corps volunteers are so much influenced um, on that there's so much that America has to offer, you know, and, and so cohorts come in with um, gender and ethnicity and race and religion and colors and personal preferences and all those sort of thing and all what we do in in country is you train volunteers to know that well this is what Ghana looks like and this is particularly maybe what they might think America looks like and then we go to the communities and we train families like well this is what America looks like but this is maybe what you thought it looked like and so we gave examples and like we'd break out a map of the United States of America and show that, oh my gosh, it's 50 states, almost 330 million people. And it's a land of immigrants. And so people are gonna look orange and blue and green and the food's gonna be um, up and down and in and out and spicy and not spicy. And and so you, you, you recognize, and this is also part of the process for a host. When a host family is super excited to learn all of this and understand this cultural exchange that's going to happen, you're like, oh my gosh, I got one. This is going to be a fabulous intercultural exchange with a host family and a volunteer and a community. You're on board. Sign you up right now. And so Damien is right. To get his host mom to say, what's up, Damien? Let me cook for her. I wonder how that roti tasted, Damien. She's like, come boy, come boy. Can we take your boy? <laughs> I'm like, what? She's like, come boy. So I think it was good. I didn't really make the roti by chance. I made my own uh, Saudi roti, right? So I think Saudi roti is more of a... Uh, he means like a sada tortilla. roti. Sorry. Roti. Yes. So in Anyways. the animal oil roti and we have sada roti it's two different kind of methodology and ways to combine your ingredients so sada roti they got like 13 forms of roti all right take like <laughs> they got sada roti they got 20 different versions of roti i just like roti and i made it my roti it actually worked it so I, i'm glad i was able to do that and it worked so I was like you know as american again you come and again it's cross-cultural do food and that's another thing too is like um, that's another language, right? I'm a foodie. I love food. You go to my Instagram page, you go anything, you'll see a lot of food on there because I love food. And I think that connects a lot of us. A lot of things are done over food. And I was able to bridge a lot of gaps through food. And it was just like having recipes. I like someone said Ukraine, they did it in Ukraine. That's a great club how to do that. And it's like, to me, it was like, our nature is, our, our whole being is what we eat, right? So a lot of our diet and everything comes from that. So it goes back into when I was in the medic. I literally used that. Uh, one of the stories was, uh, it was out of obesity, right? So I figured like, you know what, let's, let's do something a little different. I'm not gonna change what you do. I just wanna change what we, ingredients we put in there. It's gonna taste the same. 
everything else. So I think whatever it was, like, again, so you won't offend anyone. I said, hey, you know, instead of we using uh, brown sugar, you know, and there's so much cane, right? Because the guy has a lot of cane, cane fields, and I use that stuff. I said, how about we use like, you know, things like coconut milk? You know what I mean? So we get the, 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 the purities of coconut milk and what it does. You know, another thing was uh, using tangerine as you want to uh, use that um, lime, you know? So I was able to introduce these things and we talking about baking, right? So it was really cool to see that. And they respected me more because I didn't take away as much as uh, I complimented what they was doing. I said, this is some great stuff, but I don't, I'm trying to stay slim. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep working out like 30, 30. I mean, literally they feed you. In every house you go to, they gonna give you a little, a hand or something. And you gotta, you know, you gotta eat it. But again, like Hawaii, right? So it's like here too. Like you go to someone's house, they gonna expect you to, and it's, it's not, it's not that they got a lot of things to give you. It's just a cultural ohana of how you you are accepted. You know, they give you that and I love it. So it was like, for me, I was like, all right, I ain't got to go back groceries now. So I'm going to go to my neighbor's house. I know she's going to feed me. So I was like, I, I had moments where I could save them a little money. Look, because you only get so much, right? So it was a good time again to bridge that gap over food. And not, if you're not a verbal person, you got to figure out what's best for you. And that was that one of those. And then I was able to take the little coaster cap and I taught in the schools. Uh, it was an HFLE. It was more like this first, not secondary, but the uh, elementary side. And I didn't speak that language. I talked pretty fast and I was able to use recycle my uh, uh, butter caps and I put a smiley face on her or a sad face on her and I'll ask the students like, can you understand what I'm saying? I'll raise it. They did understood. I used those students to talk or translate for me to the students that couldn't understand. And it was, it was another way of bridging that gap again. I'm just using what you already have and, and just keep, again, keep an open mind. You just got to keep an open mind and you already got it in you. You just got to like find ways to navigate around it. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing up the topic of food. Um, I'm going to explain. Oh, no, sorry. I'm going to um, amplify what Renata said in the chat, which she says, I think it's a great point for peace building, trying to complement um, existing practices and meeting people where they are and trying to respectfully mesh these new ideas. Um, and I definitely want to be conscious of time. I know people in the audience must have so many questions. So I'm just gonna present you all with this final question. Maybe a quick one is before we go to Q&A um, is what would you say to students or community members or perhaps maybe your own children one day um, who are considering the Peace Corps um, and once it's safe to return, do you have any words of advice for them? Um, Oh, and yeah, what would you say to someone who's thinking about the Peace Corps? I'm going to say, man, you know what? Um, I was kind of going over, I was talking about this earlier. It's like, when you join Peace Corps, I mean, really, you, you join a lineage, lineage uh, of history, right? John F. Kennedy, you think about all these individuals that, uh, uh, that had a part of like social, social movement. If you really want to do a social movement and be part of something big, uh, you need to join Peace Corps. I think for again, for my children and my son, he's going to be, he's going to actually do that. He's going to live that lineage. He has no choice. You know, he's going to have to do it no matter what. Because again, it's, it's just that. I mean, for real, to be honest, see, uh, it's like being a member only club. And you can see right now, we, we the member only club. And be, come, be, come be a part of that member, member only club. I met a guy actually in Miami when I was literally first, not even, I wasn't even, I didn't get squared in yet. And I met this guy. He said, and he looked at me, he said, man, we said, what are you guys doing over here? I said, this is Peace Corps. And I was just, and I felt good saying it, wrote off the tongue really well. And he said, man, I, I've been there since 1963. And I was like, I just met history. And I said, I appreciate that. What did you think I should do? And he went to, see, I went to Africa. I said, well, what do you think I should do? And that's how I kind of got where I'm in peace. I always ask, like, uh, again, if you don't know your ex, I said, he said, oh, I would have done this a little different. I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to do this a little different. So I would say, I was definitely say, if you've always been volunteering, Peace Corps literally is a family. I mean, when I got to Hawaii, I was able to jump in that, and that was great. Uh, one thing I would say, if you are uh, thinking about getting uh, Peace Corps, given the climate of what's going on, bring hand sanitizer. Have a lot of it. <laughs> Have a lot of it. I'm serious. You're going to touch things. You're going to like gooey. And just out of curiosity, you're going to touch it. And not by chance. It's going to happen. You're going to touch a lot of things. But I, I'm not really a drover foe, but I like clean hands. So please bring hand sanitizer. And, you know, just be, be open-minded with that. Uh, just other than that, man, and just... You go on a really, every time you have a, someone even speak about Peace Corps, they go, you automatically just go to that level. Um, in my interview process, I can just literally pull for so many different avenues of 
how to be diversified and it just speaks for you already. It's just like, it's just like something put on a resume. They gonna probably pull you in there. Like, again, like you graduated from a high school or college, you are part of the alumni, you know, um, uh, it's just, it's there, you gotta do it. I mean, it's just one of those things in your lifetime, you gotta do Peace Corps in some form of fashion. It doesn't matter how long you got in it. If you didn't even swear in, at least you can say, I, I, I know Peace Corps. And again, it's like being, it's like being again, like the army and ones of, you know, how are you gonna serve? I really, that's the way I can serve my country. I'll serve my, my culture and my people. And uh, man, I just love it. I think everybody should do it. Mandatory. It's a mandatory thing for my kids. I tell them all the time. It's mandatory. No, no question asked. I don't care how long you get in there. You're going to do it. I'm going to come visit you because I'm doing it for free. All right. You're good. I just want to say, <laughs> I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> but the, um, I think commitment is super important. Commitment to that promise you made yourself. Commitment to the to the reason why you want to join the Peace Corps. I think commitment is the one, one of the most important word that'll get you through your whole process because it's inevitable. You're going to get culture shock. You're going to get um, geographical shock. You're, you're just, it's, and you just got to keep reminding yourself, you know, that commitment you made to yourself for your service and let that keep um, refreshing you and reviving you when you feel like I can't do this anymore or I miss my country or I miss my family or I don't think I can survive this heat another day or, or the food is different or I miss um, going um, blue waters because Ghana water is black or gray. And so you, you just have to continue to be committed to that process and that promise you made yourself. And, and also just do it. Just do it. I think Nike will really endorse you. <laughs> do the next Nike commercial, next to LeBron James and the rest of them. So, you yeah, well, this is Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you both so much um, for taking the time. And I know um, maybe one of you needs to leave for um, some, uh, to, for something, but I think that we do have one more question in the chat, um, which is, can Peace Corps use Facebook with the locals to expand the concept of peace? You know, one of the things when I was in Peace Corps, I literally try to stay away from social media. Uh, I really wanted to actually indulge in a culture in itself. I think we get so caught up in social media and we want to post what we're doing, like, oh, this is my next thing. I think it, it, it takes away from actually taking that experience because you're looking for that next picture. Uh, you're looking for that next Instagram post. And I think you're not really necessarily in more immersed in a culture. Like one, one of the questions in Peace Corps was, they asked us this question in training, like how would you uh, take away nature and leave it like it is? And I was like, Somebody reading, so I would say, man, let's do this. I say, you know, I was like, uh, take a picture, take a picture and save that moment, you know, what I mean? and then put some thought to it, right? I do real estate and I always say, I take a picture and I leave it and I, I manifest on it, and then before I post it, right? So it's like, don't be so. I mean, yes, Facebook's a great way of navigating everything else, but really, I was in the bush and I didn't have no technology, and I really found myself and I was able to come to Hawaii, live in Hawaii, be sustainable from using that Peace Corps uh, experience because I was, I was okay. We're finding the true me. I think we got so many layers and we and we put it out there for media, which is great, but at the same time, we don't take enough to just sever the moment, right? And it's just like you really just like take a picture and just save it. Um, it's not going anywhere, you're gonna get to it. And then, yeah, it's another platform of communication like we're doing now, but I, I always say don't don't be so quick to do it. Uh take a lot of baby pictures. They always work. I took a lot of baby pictures. I, I um and uh, I just kept it. So just to jump into it, I mean, Facebook is a phenomenal way to keep connected. As I noticed, person are mentioning in the chat, you know, you stay in connection with your host families, friends you've made, community member, the students you've taught, all those sort of things. But Damien is making an extremely valuable point as well. You really do want to immerse yourself into the culture you're in so that you can embrace that experience that is at the Peace Corps. And so I think it's, it'll be very important to like find your balance with what you do with social media and what you do with your experience as a Peace Corps volunteer. Yeah, like with that, I would love to turn it back to Jose, who I think is live streaming this on, on Facebook. <laughs> yes, you are correct. And uh, thank you so much. Just uh, I, 
I, I think one of the things I always hear when it comes to technology and, and social media, like it's a tool. It's like you go into the shop, it's a, you know, it's a hammer, it's, it's a, it's, it's a screwdriver. Like it's not the essential piece of what's going to drive things. And I think what is truly the essential piece is the humanity of it and just uh, what we all do with it. And I think that's truly the, the beautiful part of it. And so, and I think that's really what you, you all have really gotten through and, you know, don't disconnect from the people, uh, enjoy the moment uh, in all parts of your life. And, and I think that's one of the wearful things about technology sometimes that it, many times as we walk around we're like oh look at everyone's just like staring at their phones <laughs> as opposed to like looking up and just admiring the beauty around you or just uh accidentally you might bump into someone so so yeah i i think there's lots of great ways to use not like we're using technology now to connect during this pandemic right now <laughs> and we adjust um but uh yeah i think uh there's there's so much that we've also learned i think by being at home and being able to really cherish those moments with uh, those close to us. So I just want to thank you, Fasila uh, and Damien, for allowing us to learn about your unique perspectives and stories about training, preparing, facilitating partnerships uh, between host country communities and Peace Corps volunteers in Guyana. Um, I, I think our Q&A is over. I don't think anybody else has questions that I see here. Um, but if anyone does have questions, please feel free to email. Our emails are actually on our titles today. So if you are like, what are their emails? Just look at what our, like here at the Monson Alliance, it's, it's uhipfy.edu. So we'll be getting a few emails from our community members. Um, but yeah, I just truly appreciate you both opening up your experience in the world, wonderful just lessons learned, as well as the tips that have come out of today's dialogue. Um, such power for food and just a great way to connect and just the way you all described it, I just, I was like, oh, <laughs> it was, when you opened the door, I was like, oh, there was this smell that just probably like, you know, went in the air and people were like, what's going on in there? I want to find out. And so um, just thank you so much. Um, just very, the tips that I know, these tips are going to be very useful to future Peace Corps volunteers. Thank you for your kindness and leadership in the field as we explore your journey into the profession. Uh, also, thank you, Stephanie, for guiding today's dialogue uh, and developing this wonderful co collaborative. I uh, much appreciate you. And last but not least, thank you to all of you in the audience joining us. Uh, and we deeply appreciate your interest and support in joining us to learn about exploring the journey of the profession through our careers in peace building talk story series.